Hello, and welcome to this Laker lesson, part of our Research into Action series. I'm Vanessa Kiesler, an education evaluation consultant, and I work with the Grand Valley Charter School Office to bring you this Research into Action series. And today, we are focused on disciplinary literacy. Before we dive into today's topic, I want to start off by reminding us about three big things about research. And for all of our Research into Action videos, we start here. The first thing is research varies in quality. There's really excellent research out there. There's research that doesn't follow all the best practices and what you need to do to produce good evidence. Um, but that can be really hard as a consumer to discern. Is this good? Is it bad? Especially when you're a practicing educator, you're thinking about other things. That's why the Grand Valley Charter School Office has invested and produces this series for you so that you can have access to high quality research without having to try to figure that out on your own with your very limited time. The second thing to keep in mind about research is that there's two big ways that research is done or the kind of results it produces. One produces associations or correlational research. So that's where you say this type of teaching style appears to be associated with this type of outcome. That's not the same as causal research, cause and effect, where you do a treatment and you test something and you say, okay, we had a treatment and a control group and we can prove that the treatment group you know, had this much more outcome than the control group. Cause and effect research, causal research is a lot harder to do, especially in education, because withholding a good practice from a group of students to see if it works is unethical a lot of the time, very difficult to pull off. I raise this because you want to know when people say, if we do this practice, it will definitely raise test scores or it will definitely increase attendance. They're using language that says, well, we tested the cause and effect and there's evidence to, you know, strong evidence for a causal relationship versus the best research on this suggests that there's a good, really a positive relationship between this practice and this outcome. That means you need to try it, but you need to stay open to, you know, what happens and keep doing your own daily research into, is this practice getting us to where we need to go? Both are okay, but something that often happens in education research and data conversations is people say causal claims when they really mean associations. And I'm spending extra time on this today because the topic we're going to talk about today actually has largely correlational research behind it. Um, it's not as much cause and effect research. And again, that's okay. There's good evidence to suggest these practices help, but I wanna make sure I'm plain and clear with you about the level of evidence that I'm bringing forward in this video. And the last thing I wanna say is that research is science, so it's always evolving. So right now, today, people are studying topics across education, and we we're going to talk about what we know right now, the most current research, but as people continue to engage in scientific inquiry, they find new things. Again, that's why it's great that Grand Valley Charter School Office provides these videos, because you get updated access to the latest thinking on a variety of topics, and you can keep track of where the science is about educational practice. And I've already mentioned this a couple times, but not only does Grand Valley Charter School Office provide these research into action videos for you, but they also invest in quality research. They find quality research and they engage in producing quality research and making it available to you. So there's a QR code on your screen. That's where you can see all the research that the Charter School Office has engaged in or um, facilitated, you know, brought to bear on your learning and your work. And I want to also say, we're talking about disciplinary literacy today, and it's very exciting. The Grand Valley Charter School Office is at the beginning of a study into disciplinary literacy within the charter school um, ecosystem here through Grand Valley. So if you are asked to participate with a survey about disciplinary literacy or in interviews at some time in the future, say yes. Help contribute to the body of knowledge on this. Help grow what we understand about disciplinary literacy. And you'll, it will help inform your practice, but also it helps all educators learn about how disciplinary literacy works and doesn't work and how we can use it to best support our students. So be on the lookout for that. So what are we going to learn today? We're gonna start with what is disciplinary literacy? You might be thinking, I'm not sure what you're talking about or what that is. We'll start with a definition, and then we're going to look at what the research says about why disciplinary literacy matters. Like I said before, 
I think the research on this topic is not as robust as some other topics. There is some good research, there's, and a lot of good common sense, but it's exciting that people like the Grand Valley Charter School Office and others are continuing to investigate this because I think the evidence base could get stronger. That being said, we're gonna look at what the research already says, what we know, um, and then we're gonna think about what are some of those key evidence-based ways you can promote the development of disciplinary literacy in learners. Today's talk uses probably three key resources. The Cedar Center has a whole disciplinary literacy effort. Um, the Fordham Institute did a study about social studies instruction and reading comprehension, and that's one of a, kind of a new, newer and um, one of the more referenced studies in this space, I would say. And then there's a person named Timothy Shanahan, who is like a person who does literacy research and has for years, is very focused on disciplinary literacy. At this point, he has his own website and he has professional development and whatnot, but he has held a number of uh, academic and research positions throughout his life. So um, if you Google him, go to his website, there's a lot of good resources there based on basically his whole career of working around literacy and disciplinary literacy in particular. What is disciplinary literacy? So the definition is reading, writing, listening, speaking, thinking critically, and performing in a way that is meaningful within the context of a given field or discipline. So that's both taking foundational literacy skills and situating them within a given discipline and thinking about those discipline-specific skills like vocabulary, practices, other things. We're going to unpack this more. So there's a distinction here between content area reading, you know, where you have kids read in each content area, and disciplinary literacy, where you are teaching kids how literacy can be used to create, disseminate, and critique information in a specific discipline. So, for example, in math, how does a mathematician read text? How do they read data and information and charts? How do they talk and write and share findings from mathematics? How, what does that look like? It's not just reading in math class or reading in social studies. A little bit of background, it's funny when you dig into this, this is an idea that is floating around all over the place in education, but maybe not called out. So this idea is definitely embedded in the Common Core State Standards work that you should students should be engaging with meaningful text and functioning like a, like a scholar within math, within uh, English language arts, um, and then within science and social studies, which are not part of the Common Core, but um, the, the national standards efforts around that as well. Getting students to be the discipline, you know, do the work of the discipline, not just learn about it or not just read text. The foundational text for this probably is this cultural literacy book by E.D. Hirsch back in the 80s, but that was where he started really developing the idea that literacy is not just about decoding, it's about context. And then, like I said, the, the Fordham study, which is relatively recent, uh, there's a very interesting finding from that. So they looked at the time that, um, when schools were investing additional time blocks in ELA, in social studies, in math, in science, they actually found that additional time spent in social studies increased um, led to increased reading ability or was positively associated with reading ability more than increasing the time in, in ELA classes. So basically having kids spend extra time in social studies was associated with a greater increase in their literacy than having them spend more time on quote literacy. So the inference there is when you're doing this disciplinary literacy, when you're applying literacy skills within a specific context, it actually helps you not only learn about the discipline, but it increases your, your core literacy. So what are some issues when you're thinking about trying to approach disciplinary literacy? Um, the first is, this may sound basic, but this came up in a lot of the research. You need to have kids reading. You need to be giving them text. Um, don't avoid text. And in today's era of you know TikTok and YouTube and Snapchat, and I have teenagers, so I get it, it's, it's tempting to give kids not text, to give them other ways to interact with the material. And of course, that's part of good instruction that you give them multi modes. But giving them text, meaningful text, real text to dig into in all the disciplines is the first place to start. Make sure kids are reading. And then help make sure it's appropriate and helpful for this disciplinary literacy purpose. So for example, you should be giving kids conflicting evidence about topics. You should give them alternative points of view to read on, on any specific topic. Um, 
primary source documents. You know, this is something that's been around for a while, but having kids read actual primary sources, not just textbooks about primary sources, but reading the primary sources, and then exposing them to information expressed in multiple forms. So text, but also text can be in charts or graphs or tables. Text can be in a book. Text can be um, as captions under pictures. So helping, making sure that kids see text in a lot of different contexts within the discipline. And then um, focusing on imparting actual subject content to students. So being a historian, being a social scientist, being a scientist, being a mathematician, and talking about things like, well, what does inquiry look like in, the, in these fields? What does a practicing scientist do? How do they do science? You know, it's, you don't do science the way you learn science a lot of the time. Um, how, how do they create questions? How do they do background research? How do they compile information? Um, how, as a historian, what does it mean to do research into history? You know, how, how do they, talking about how they gather primary texts and they come at them to understand something about a piece of history that we don't know about, or they interrogate things we think we know with other sources of data, right? Other texts that maybe contradict the way we understand a certain historical event. And then this conversation of what constitutes evidence. And it's, it's kind of funny because we started this video talking about evidence within education research. What are the levels of evidence? How do you know what's good evidence? Um, how do you criticize the evidence? But every discipline has this. You know, what is, what is good evidence in math? How do you know that this mathematical equation works or whatnot? Clearly, I'm not a practicing mathematician, so I don't talk about that as, as easily. But within um, social science, you know, why do we think why would we revisit something about history and look at it differently? Like, why do we think a primary source document is valid? How do we think this conflicting view has evidence to bring to bear? And how do you critique that fairly that's outside of just, I don't like it or I don't agree? How do you use analytical methods to critique the text? Moving into a couple specific strategies. So in English language arts, um, and again, because English language arts is already focusing on literacy a lot, but also broader than literacy, this is probably a little more aligned to how a lot of uh, ELA teachers are approaching teaching literacy. But um, some of the key components are things like story elements. So helping kids understand the who, what, where, when, and why. Helping them learn to look at literal versus implied meaning in text. Um, themes in text structures. So how do you how do you look read something and say what was the big idea? What was the theme? What did we learn from this? And then obviously all the introduction to genres, you know, poetry, essays, fiction, nonfiction. Um, I was just the other day I wrote a little poem about my kids and how they don't clean up and I was kind of hearkening back to my younger years and people teaching about like iambic pentameter or like poem structure and I thought oh good job Mrs. Bartos for teaching me these things that stuck with me so I could write a poem about my kids taking out the garbage. In mathematics a couple of specific things to, to focus on with kids. Um, searching this idea of searching for the truth and for errors. So in math, there is almost always an answer. There is a right answer and there is not a right answer. But, but how does that, what does that look like? Like, how do you, how do you talk about that? Um, and where is that, does that, that hold true? So how do you teach kids to try to understand what, um, what that is, what those ideas are? Uh, going through the importance of each word and symbol. You know, math has its whole own language. So making sure you are explicit with kids about symbols, words, you know, what does it, what do all these things mean so they can read the second language of mathematics. Uh, focusing on interpretation of information presented in unusual ways. So if kids are, or if, if people become used to numbers, and solutions being presented in a certain way, what are other ways? Graphs, charts, uh, data visualization. You know, there's been such an explosion in data visualization in recent years that, you know, helping kids understand how to look at all of those pieces. And then all of the mathematical modeling and problem solving. And so this gets into some of the, you know, text and math, problem, story problems, that sort of thing. But also the idea of how do you take the world 
and put it into a mathematical model and try to solve it. Like when you see a phenomenon happening and how do you create an equation from that? How do you apply numbers to that? Um, how do you read about that and solve problems and bring math to bear on the problem solving? In history and social studies, some specific disciplinary literacy skills are author's perspective and bias. And, and this gets to sourcing, this gets to the quality of the evidence. So asking kids not only to read primary text, but to step back and say, who is this author? What do we know about them? And now, again, it's easy. If we don't know, we can easily look that up online. But what do we know about their background, their history, their bias? Like, how are they talking about whatever event is happening from their perspective? Um, where did this come from? Like, how are we sure it's good? Could it be a forgery? And Again, interestingly, I think kids today, with all of the like fakes and whatnot that can happen online, probably have a unique perspective on trying to suss out the accuracy of a source because they do that in their day-to-day -day lives online in a lot of ways. What's the time period? So what's the context? You know, you're reading this source document, you're reading about this piece, you're reading social theory or whatnot from a certain time period, what's the context? And, and how does that influence how people are writing and talking about the text in front of you? Again, this corroboration of multiple perspectives and documents that, you know, to be sure something happened, you probably need more than one perspective on it. You need, you need different documents, different source documents that say the same thing. This is a lot of how historians do history as they look for corroborating evidence from different perspectives and then focus on what is consistent and what, di what is different and how to understand that. And then uh, rhetorical constructions. So just how people who are writing history, who are writing within the social sciences, are using different forms of rhetoric to get their point across. In science, some of the disciplinary literacy ideas or skills to use are um, focusing on facts based on evidence. So what is a fact we can derive from the evidence that we've been given uh, from, the, from an experiment or from observation? Again, reading graphs, reading charts, reading formulas, understanding how those fit into scientific inquiry, how to read them, how to deconstruct them and make meaning of them. Uh, corroboration, so again, this idea of a lot of science is replicating or agreeing, like can we get the same result with the same assumptions? Um, and also how can we take, the second part is transformation, how can we take the result that somebody got and move it into transformation, like transform it into something new, build on their learning and transform it into additional learning. And then exposing students within science to data analysis, hypothesis, observations, investigation. I mean, this is the core of the scientific method, but there's a lot of dis the literacy involved here too. You have to read data, you have to write, read and write your hypotheses, you have to record your observations and read them, you have to engage in investigation, and there's text around that that you have to do, and you also have to be taught how to understand it when others are doing it. So that's a lot of ideas, and I, you know, I'm thinking if I was a teacher reading this, it's like, well, those are, that's a lot of big ideas. Um, how, how might I start? If I feel like I need to do more with disciplinary literacy, how might I start? Um, Again, coming back to giving students text to read, meaningful text, <laughs> text that has these pieces in it, whatever your discipline is, like what are some texts that get them beyond the textbook into core text from the discipline? And then being explicit and explaining how to approach the text from the specific discipline. And if you're not sure, you might need to do a little bit of research yourself. Um, on, you know, how, how would a mathematician approach a new proof? Or how would a, you know, like I would do that research if I was trying to teach math. Um, how would a social scientist, how does a social scientist come to a research study and understand the level of evidence it's providing? And the other part that we haven't talked about yet, but it's important to also ask students to compose text and revise text in that disciplinary style. So it's not just about intake, it's about writing. Can you write a... Uh, the results from your experiment? Can you write a point of view perspective on a historical moment? Can you write how you solved a problem in math? So the, there's two parts of literacy. There is the reading, the intake, and then there's the production of that. I already mentioned this a little, but I, again, I sat, when I was pulling this together, I'm like, okay, you know, when I, I taught social studies, 
and I was like, maybe I wasn't, probably when I was teaching social studies, I wasn't sure what a social scientist did necessarily, like a practicing social scientist did. So I would have had to do some research. And these are the questions that I would have looked. Like, who who does this? Who is doing, who reads or write this sorts of, reads or writes this sort of text outside the classroom? Why, like, why would they be doing that? Um, and how do they do it? And there's a lot of good resources online about, you know, understanding the work of different professions. So I think being a little willing to be lifelong learners ourselves and go back and say, like, I actually don't know, like I just said, even in this video, I don't know what a practicing mathematician does all day long and how they do their work. So that would be something to learn about. And then leaders, you know, if you want your teachers doing more disciplinary literacy, clearly they're going to need some help in professional learning. Um, both in understanding what it means to do this work in the disciplines and then how to add that into the classroom. Because these are big ideas that are not um, not easily implemented without some professional learning and some feedback. It might be a chance to be bold and try some things that are are not necessarily natural or don't feel like something you're really comfortable doing. And I wanted to end by saying, at the end of the day, while disciplinary literacy is really important, even more important is high quality instruction. So offering students the opportunity for really high quality learning opportunities. Time to experience high quality instruction. On the left hand side of the screen are the 10 practices that feed into high quality instruction. We've talked about them in a previous research into action. Um, these are actually research-based, like they meet the higher levels of evidence, they've been investigated. These are the core building blocks of good instruction. So beginning your lessons with short reviews, presenting new material in small amounts and assisting students as they practice, asking questions and observing student responses, providing models with step-by-step -step demonstrations, guiding student practice, checking for understanding, working until you have a high success rate, um, providing scaffolds or temporary supports for difficult material, preparing students for and monitoring independent practice, and engaging students in weekly and monthly reviews of past material. Those 10 practices should undergird all of your instructional practice, all of your professional learning. As you add disciplinary literacy in here, it should still be within the context of these principles of instruction. So if you're going to try to introduce students to what it means to be a practicing sociologist, you would start, you would still work through that and, and pull disciplinary literacy and keeping in mind these practices of good instruction. So I just wanted to bring us back to at the end of the day, really having high quality instructional approaches is always the best thing to increase student academic outcomes. And then you can add in some of this additional thinking to help develop them in other ways and to help excite them, right? Kids like to know why, they like to have a reason, they like to think about the future, real life examples. So disciplinary literacy is also a way to engage students in meaning. You know, it's not just read this textbook to answer this question to get a grade, it's be a scientist, <laughs> be a mathematician, be a communications director, you know, whatever kind of perspective you wanna help them bring to it. And that's really motivating for students. Okay. I'm just going to close with a couple practical considerations. Um, I would suggest if, if this is, you're like, we really want to do some work on dis disciplinary literacy, I would think it's a good place to start with a review or an audit. Like, what are we actually already doing? Do we do this at all? Where do we do it? How do we do it? Who's using, you know, who across our teaching staff is using primary text? What are you using? How does it work? How are we teaching kids to approach them? You know, what is missing? Kind of take a look and say, to what extent are we or are we not doing this? Um, and what do we know as a collective, as a teaching staff, about what it means to work in specific disciplines? Like share some knowledge and come up with a plan for how you're going to approach this. Maybe it's some cross, like cross class work. You know, it's not just everybody's doing this individually, but maybe you partner up with another teacher or across subjects and you you engage in some disciplinary literacy because we know that work in the real world is often not as siloed as we teach it in school. Um, I also would say 
as a starting point, ask students to engage in unpacking what this means. So ask them to research and look into what do historians do, what do mathematicians do, help you know, get them to understand why having disciplinary literacy is important and helpful to them. Um, brainstorm with them a list of careers in each content area and have them go understand something about them. This also has good impacts on helping kids articulate a future path. It's good for career readiness and making meaning as they move through their K-12 experiences. Um, and then you could do some class or small group activities that help articulate how career, each career and dis or each discipline uses text and information. This has the side benefit of helping kids do small group work, collaboration, leadership, these um, future ready skills that we know kids need in addition to their literacy. In closing, I want to thank you for joining us for this Research Into Action today, and good luck on your disciplinary literacy journey.